Hey, good morning. Glad you're here this morning. We got a great group. Um, it's been a pre pretty day this today. Um, a little bit of rain yesterday, but that's okay. Uh, we got a special way to start the service this morning. A friend of a new friend of mine, Scott White, I've actually known for about nine years, but he's not known me. Um, I'll tell you why later, but um, is going to be here. Uh, pa one of the things I love about Pastor Greg is how he has 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 a heart for missions local and around the world, and he's trying to bring that into our church. And, and this is another opportunity that he wanted to bring um, us, give us another opportunity to um, spread the gospel. So, Scott, come up and talk for a second. Sure will. Thank you, Pastor Mark. Don't you appreciate Brother Mark? Love him already. I am thrilled to be here. I called Pastor Greg. I said, Pastor Greg, I'm going to be in your area because I am see the Jubilee Conference, which is held down at the uh, Myrtle Beach Convention Center starting Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. My pastor, Johnny Hunt, anybody ever heard of him? I don't know if you have or not. Okay, both of you. That's good. <laughs> he, uh, he preaches all over America, and God's blessed us to be together. I've been with him 26 years there, and so we just finished at First Baptist Woodstock. He's now the vice president of North American Mission Board in evangelism, and I'm working with a ministry now out of the Nashville, Tennessee area. And I, I called your pastor. I said, Greg, I really want to come share about our missions. And he says, Scott, I love you. I love Pastor Johnny, but you're just not ready yet. And I thought, well, okay. So I waited a few few weeks and I called him back. I said, Brother Greg, I really want to come. I want to come to First Baptist North Myrtle Beach and share. I heard you got a good church. Man, I love you, but you just aren't ready yet. Third time I called him, I was ready to come. I said, Greg, let me come share with you people. Please, I'll come for free. He said, now you're ready. I love your pastor. He's a good man. He's still going strong next door. Amen. We were over there. Hey, I want to take just a couple of minutes and share with you what we're doing. If you could be a part of getting the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, that he was born of a virgin, lived a perfect life, was buried, and rose again on the third day, that is the gospel. Amen. If you could be a part of getting that gospel to the people of Cambodia and never leaving North Myrtle Beach, would you want to do it? Sure you would. Who wouldn't? We want to get the gospel to everyone. Well, I've got a two-minute video, and I want you to give your attention to the screens and listen and watch. Maybe God would have you partner with us to get that gospel to them. Watch this video. Not so very long ago, the ancient kingdom of Cambodia was a place ravaged by the communist dictator Pol Pot. His government began an attempted and horrifying genocide, murdering and torturing nearly 40% of his own people. It is estimated that nearly 2 million Cambodians died of starvation and execution in what is now famously known as the Killing Fields. Since that time, Cambodia has tried to heal in every way, but these humble, hardworking, loving people have been deprived of hope for so long. Imagine if your children or family lived in such a place. What would you do to make sure they heard the gospel? What price would you pay to rescue those you love? These precious, forgotten, and abandoned people have no voice. But right here, right now, in this very moment, we are their voice. For nearly 20 years, the Power of Grace Ministry has been sharing the good news of the gospel in Cambodia. Now, through our distribution of free radios, every Cambodian can have access to hearing the gospel in their native tongue. The follow-up visits by our Power of Grace Ministry local church teams will help develop long-lasting relationships with those that receive Jesus as Savior. We believe that by discipling the next generation, we have greater potential for this nation to be rescued from the cult of Buddhism. For a one-time gift of $50, you can send a radio as a beacon of light. Entire communities sometimes gather around one simple radio to hear the gospel message as it is preached seven days a week, even reaching deep into the remote jungles of Cambodia. Please know that a simple little radio sent by you may indeed change a life still haunted with the scars from the killing fields. For every radio that you sponsor, they have a chance at the greatest gift ever known, eternal life through Jesus Christ. Isn't that awesome to think about that? that the people you saw there were the children of the Neelands. Anybody ever heard of the Neelands, the singing group, gospel group? They travel full time. They partner with us as well. Did you hear in the video where it said they don't have a voice, the people of Cambodia? But right here, 
right now, at this very moment, we are their voice. And what does that mean? We have a chance to speak up for them and help get the gospel to them. Now, I want to bring up a slide. Here's how you can help support it. It's a texting slide. And if you have your phones, you can take it out. I know some of you have your Bible on there whatnot. You can take it out. It won't take two seconds if you're interested. And you'll text the word radios, make it plural, to that number, 844 844- 329-3290. Now, when you text there, that doesn't mean you're sponsoring a radio. It just gets you to the place where you can sponsor one if you're interested. Great way for you to do it. Maybe you want to do it at, after church or at home or later on. That's fine. Another way you can help us and partner with us is come by our table in the front foyer after church. I'll be down front, and my wife and a couple that's with us will be at the back table. Take you about two minutes to fill out a card for us, just the front of it. We take cash, check, or credit card, okay? We can process that credit card right here. We take any amount. If you'd like to do $50, that would sponsor one radio. The radios are solar-powered or kinetic-driven. We can crank them or the sun runs them. Once the radios are sponsored, we purchase them through Power Grace Radio Ministries in Nashville, Tennessee, and we ship them in huge containers to Cambodia, and then they are distributed by our seminary, excuse me, our pastors and evangelists to get them to the people so they can hear the gospel in their language on those radios. Isn't that cool? A lot of them have never even seen a radio, just to be honest with you. Now, we have smartphones. Some of us have dumb phones, but we all have phones. But a radio, do you remember way back in the day when radios came out and how we felt about them, maybe when we first heard them? You saw the kids around them. I'll tell you one quick story, and I'm done. On our pull-up, you'll see it. They'll bring it back over here. There's a na- lady, a picture of a lady called Lulu on that pull-up. When this video was footage was taken in 2019 before COVID hit us, Lulu came by and heard something going on in a house where you saw those young boys around the radio, and she stopped to listen. She walked in, and as only God could do it, heard the gospel, and got saved. Isn't that great? Well, she came back the next day, and she had a chicken under her arm, and she said, I want one of those. She didn't know it was called a radio. I said, what do you mean you want one? I want one of those, and I'll give you my chicken for one of those radios. Now, I'm just going to tell you, over in that part of the world, a chicken's a valuable thing. Obviously, they didn't take her chicken. They gave her a radio because someone else had sponsored it and helped. Amen? But the good news is she's heard the gospel, and you'll, you'll see her testimony. It's written on that pull-up where she said, now I'm living off the living word of God. Isn't that great? And she's got a radio and inviting people to hear it. So it works. And the bottom line is we just need people to partner with us. No pressure. We only want you to do what God tells you to do. But I know this, if you don't know about it, you can't do it. That's what I tell people. And remember this, it's only good news if it gets there in time. That's what I tell people. So Romans 10, 17 says, Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. We want to get that Word of God out through these radios. So if you're interested, stop by our table, text that word radios to that number, and you can do it online. However you want to do it, we'd love to have you partner with us. Okay, say uh uh-huh. Good, thank you. Let me pray for us. Lord, thank you so much for this church. What a joy to be in three services this morning. God, you're just working here, and it's evident these people love you. They love missions. And God, thank you for the chance Pastor Greg's given me to come and just share another opportunity for these men and women, boys and girls. And Lord, I pray by the Spirit of God that you would move in the hearts of these men and women who have heard about it, and as they're hearing what you're saying to them, they would be obedient to obey. And only that, nothing else. Lord, you're our God, you're our King, we serve a King, not a beggar. But yeah, Lord, we want to be a part of something bigger than us. So help us get the gospel to Cambodia through these radios, Lord, and use these people to do it. And I'll be careful to praise you for it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Thanks for letting me share with you. Thank you so much, Mark. God bless you, church. We'll be in the back after the services. Amen. Great opportunity to ministry. Well, let's worship together. Why don't you stand with me as we sing Wonderful Grace of Jesus. Wonderful grace of Jesus, greater than all my sin. How shall my tongue describe it? Where shall its praise begin? Taking away my burden, setting my spirit free. What a wonderful grace of Jesus. Wonderful the matchless grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea, higher 
than the mountains, sparkling like a fountain of sufficient grace for even me. Broader than the scope of my transgressions, greater far than all my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus, praise His name. Wonderful grace of Jesus, reaching to all the lost. By it I have been pardoned, saved to the uttermost. Chains have been torn asunder. Matchless grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea. Higher than the full grace, all sufficient grace for even me, for even me. Broader than the scope of my transgression, greater far than all my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus. Deeper than the mighty rolling sea, higher than the mountains, sparkling like a fountain, all sufficient grace for even me. Broader than the scope of my transgression, greater far than all my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus. Revelations 4 says the 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne and they will worship him who lives forever and ever and will cast their crowns before the throne saying worthy you are our Lord and our God to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and because of your will they existed and were created and crown him with many crowns. Crown him with many crowns, the Lamb upon his throne. Hark how the heavenly anthem drowns all music but its own. Awake, my soul, and sing of him who died for thee. 
holy ground. This is holy ground. We're standing on holy ground. For the Lord is present and where He is is holy. This is Good morning. It's good to be with you. Let's turn together to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. We're going to look at the first 10 verses in chapter 12 as well. And this morning I want to give you a message entitled, The Gift of Weakness. I don't know if you've ever had a gift like that before. Some of us have had strange gifts. Some of us have had unexpected gifts. Sometimes you get a gift you think is terrible, turns out to be great. Well, this gift of weakness is kind of all three of those. I'm going to break the message down today into three parts, though. I'm going to talk to you about a basket, a blessing, and a beating. So if you want to break it down in your, if you take notes, that's how you can do it. A basket, a blessing, and a beating. 
But weakness is something that most people don't like. And Paul says, if there's anything that I want to brag about in my life, it's my weaknesses. Now, that seems very, very strange. So we need to know why. Because if it's important for Paul to be effective as an apostle, as a missionary, certainly we need to know his secret here. So let's read the text together. Verse 30, chapter 11 of uh, 2 Corinthians. If I have to boast... I will boast of what pertains to my weakness. The God and Father of the Lord Jesus, he who is blessed forever, knows that I am not lying. In Damascus, the ethnarch under Aretas, the king, was guarding the city of the Damascenes in order to seize me. And I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and so escaped his hands. Boasting is necessary, though, although it is not profitable. But I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body, I don't know. Whether out of the body, I don't know. God knows. Such a man was called up to the third heaven. And I know how such a man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I don't know. But God knows. He was called up into paradise and heard inexpressible words, which a man is not permitted to speak. On behalf of such a man, I will boast, but on my own behalf, I will not boast, except in regard to my weaknesses. For if I do not wish to boast, I w- for if I do wish to boast, I will not be foolish, for I will be speaking the truth. But I refrain from this, so that no one will credit me with more than he sees and hears from me. Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. To keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. And he has said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then, then I am strong. I grew up in the 80s watching movies that usually showed a big guy that looked like he was on steroids. would be one guy a lot of times fighting armies, Rambo and Terminator, people like that. And you could send 100 or 1,000 to get some, somebody like that. And he, I mean, he might have his pocket knife, but he'd beat them all. You know, I mean, that's just the way those movies go, right? Uh, I mean, stick a bubble gum and a pair, pack of matches, and he's got them. I mean, it didn't take much, but that's the way the, the world portrays what's desirable, and people see stuff like that, and they want it, and they dream about it. Everybody wants to be the person on the team that wins the championship, makes the last shot, catches the, the touchdown pass to win it all, hoists the trophy, wears the ring. Uh, strength, winning, victory, power, all that stuff. Everybody finds that attractive and appealing. And Paul looks at all that and says, let me tell you what I want to brag about in my life. My weaknesses. And you just scratch your head and say, what? (laughs) Is is that really what he said? Let me read that again. Yeah, he said, if I had to boast, verse 30, I'm going to boast in what pertains to weakness. And then Paul goes on and tells a story about how he was let down in a basket in this city. He was running, scared for his life. In fact, if you want to take a pen and keep it out, I'll give you some things to write in your Bible to help you. One of the things you can put right outside that story is Acts chapter 9, verse 23 through 25, because that's where the story takes place in the book of Acts. Let me just read it to you to give you a little bit more information about it. It says, When many days had elapsed, the Jews plotted together to do away with him. Talking about Paul, who at that time's name had not changed, and it was still called Saul. He said, But their plot became known to Saul, They were also watching the gates day and night so they might put him to death. But his disciples took him by night, led him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a large basket. So get this picture. There's a big basket, maybe used to bring fish up, something like that. Big fish basket. So they catch fish. They didn't want to go to the gate, wanted to get it up to the marketplace quicker, save some steps, bring everything up in this basket over this wall, this walled city. And Paul now finds out people are out to kill him. And like we just talked about, maybe you'd like to be the guy that when the mob comes for you, 
that you stand and fight them all. You're like uh, one of those karate guys in the movies that you're Jackie Chan or somebody like that, and you do some of this stuff and grab a stick and beat them all down, and now there's 20 of them standing, I mean, laying on the ground around, and you stand up, and you're the only one still standing. You beat them all. But Paul doesn't do that. Instead, he's got to run. He's hiding. He's scared. Let down in a basket. Fish basket, maybe. It's not very dignified for an apostle, is it? Paul says, that's weakness right there. He said, I'm eat up with it. I'm full of it. I'm weak. He said, but that's what I brag on. If you want to ask me about something, let me talk about that. That was important to him. But it probably needs to be said because most of us deal with weaknesses, don't we? Most of us have things in our life we wish were different. Uh, we dream about one thing, but life is completely different. We want our health to be good, but we've got ongoing ailments. We get migraines and gout, and sometimes there's disabilities and handicaps that are long-term and persevering, and sometimes they're, they're painful things that we endure uh, all of our life. We want to be strong, and we're weak. Uh, we think about beauty a lot of times as, as an asset to have, and it opens up doors and, 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 and helps you in lots of ways in this life. And, and yet people look at their bodies. Sometimes they have body issues, and they think, this is such a weakness that I don't have uh, the, the look that I want to have. People want to have strength. They want to be the one that makes the team and starts on the team and, 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 and is, is the is the the alpha on that team. That's what I was trying to think of. But instead... You maybe don't even make the team, and if you do make the team, maybe you ride the bench, and maybe you're on a team that never wins, and, and we think just weak, weak, weak everywhere. And You want to be financially independent, and you want to have resources in the bank to draw upon. You want to have a good, strong retirement account, and you thought, well, I wanted to really in life work in a business way and study that, and, but I was never able to get to the school, or I never had the education, or I never, even if you had the education, maybe you failed several times in life. Or maybe you just come from poverty and never were able to get out of it and so poverty is in your life and debt life and debts in your life and you don't have strength as far as assets go and you find yourself to be really weak or maybe where you come from maybe your family background brought a lot of things against you and you had a lot going against you all of your life because of that it's just a lot of weaknesses there People want to be popular, and they want everybody to like them, and they find themselves to be lonely, or they want to have a lot of connections that will get them out of trouble, bankers and attorneys and politicians they can call to help them out when they get in trouble, and they just don't have those resources and assets and connections. and A lot of weakness in this world. So Paul knows we deal with it. The Holy Spirit of God knows we deal with it. So Paul says, instead of acting like we don't have them, Instead of pretending, instead of never talking about them, Paul says, instead, I find it to be something that if there's anything in my life I do want to talk about. It's that. And I'm asking the question when I read that, Paul, why? Most people want strength. Most people want to brag about that. Paul, I don't see any of your enemies talking about their weaknesses. I see them talking about their strengths. Uh, I don't know anybody that talks about their weaknesses. Do you? No, I don't. You know, weaknesses, very often they'll lead us to have internal anguish, depression, discouragement, feeling unfulfilled in life. Like there was something that you really wanted, but you were never strong enough to get and accomplish what you wanted to. So weaknesses can be an issue for us, can't they? And Paul says, if I have to boast, I'm going to boast about my weaknesses. Before we talk about why weaknesses were so important to him, let's look at the next part. That was the basket. Let's look at the blessing that Paul had. Look at verse 1 of chapter 12. Paul says there, boasting is necessary. When he says boasting, it means he's talking about himself. He doesn't want to do that, but he's compelled to. He's got to. And the reason he's got to is he's defending himself against an attack that's been made against him by some outsiders who have infiltrated the church in Corinth and have tried to push Paul out the way in a sense. They've done that by attacking him and disparaging him, using things in his life, such as his weaknesses, to build themselves up and say, you know, if Paul was really a man of God, would he be like that? 
Would, it, would he hurt so bad? Would he struggle so bad? Would he have all these issues in his life? It, wh why wouldn't God heal him? Why wouldn't Paul, God answer his prayers? Why wouldn't God, yada, 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 and just on and on and on with this stuff. And they did it by attacking Paul, and then they also lied about themselves. See, these were false apostles, and they said some things to, to make themselves out to be more than they were. And one of the things they may have talked about is they may have told the church, well, we're people that God gives visions to. We're mystics or prophets or something like that. And Paul's had the real thing happen to him. So to kind of counter what they've been saying, Paul says, boasting is necessary. I've got to talk about this, but he says it's not profitable. Now, I'll come back to that in a second about why it's not profitable, uh, why it, it's not something really to, to be concerned with, but he says, I, I need to do it. It's necessary. So he says, I'm going to go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. So the Lord gave him a vision here, a revelation. Now, in your Bible outside verse 2, if you've got your pen and you want to write verse 7 down there and underline this word, man, in verse 2. I know a man, and I, I put verse 7 outside it in my Bible to remind me to look down in verse 7 when I see that word. And here's why. When I get to verse 7, I've underlined the word me or myself over and over again. Because the question is, when Paul says, I know a man in Christ 14 years ago who had these visions, who's he talking about? Who's the man? The answer is, it's Paul. Paul's speaking in the third person here because he's not only humbled by what God has allowed him to experience, but he is also not one that's going to take any credit for it. After all, he didn't do what happened here. God did it to him. God did it in him. But Paul doesn't like talking about himself. He likes talking about Jesus, but he doesn't want to talk about himself. So he says, uh, there's a man. Now, if you look at verse 7, again, this tells you why you know it's Paul. Verse 7 says, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me from exalting myself, me and myself over and over. Who's he talking about? This is Paul. So he says, I know a man in Christ 14 years ago, best we know, even though this happened 14 years before. We don't know that Paul ever spoke of it before now. Because why? He says boasting is necessary, but it's not profitable. It wouldn't do anybody good to talk about what he's about to say, but he's got to right here, right now. I know a man in Christ 14 years ago, whether in the body, I don't know, out of the body, I don't know, God knows. What does he mean by that statement? Well, we are taught by Scripture. In fact, Paul has used this a few times already throughout the book of 2 Corinthians, that we are both a soul or spirit as well as a body. We've got both. And we're not like somebody like Aristotle or Plato might have said. We're not a bird trapped in a cage that when you die, the bird gets free. No, we're, our soul and our body are intertwined. Think about scrambled eggs. I mean, you can't separate it. It's, uh, you know, bake a cake and you can't take the ingredients apart again. To try to do that causes a lot of violence and issues there. Well, that's what it's like for us when we die and our soul leaves our body. But we are both a soul and and a body. Paul in chapter 4 of this book called us earthen vessels, or he used the term we, in the maybe New King James Version, jars of clay. Later on in chapter 5, he talks about our earthly tent that gets taken down. That, that, that's what your body's like. So we're a soul and a spirit. So Paul says, when I got taken up to heaven, he said, I don't even understand what happened. I don't know if it was just my soul that went, or did my body and my soul go up there? I don't know. So he's trying to do the best he can to tell you about it, but even he can't fully explain what happened. It was so unusual. He says, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know. God knows. Such a man was called up to the third heaven. Uh, third heaven. So think about the first heaven as the sky where the clouds and the birds are. Think about the second heaven as outer space where Elon Musk wants to go, Mars and Saturn and Jupiter and uh, all the, the galaxies of the universe, anything above our atmosphere. There's a first heaven, there's a second heaven, but there's a third heaven that you can't get to unless you know Jesus. That's the spiritual realm where God manifests his presence, the home of God where God lives, and if you want to go to heaven, you only get there through Jesus. 
but there's a third heaven. And Paul knows Jesus, and God brings, Jesus brings Paul up to heaven for a while. I don't know. I was good the first service. Last service it got me. I'm allergic to some of y'all. <laughs> Baptist, I have a condition. I get around them and they mess me up. So anyway, I'm, I'll try to hold it in. All right, here's something else you can do. In your Bible, circle that word heaven, draw a line down to verse 4, and circle the word paradise. The word heaven and the word paradise are used interchangeably in your Bible. I'll tell you how you remember this. Jesus, when, in Luke 23, when he's hanging on a cross, all right, picture it. There's nails in his hands and feet. There's a crown of thorns on his head. His beard has been ripped out. He's covered in spit where they've spat upon him. Uh, his back is open where they've whipped him and beat him. And, and it's raking up and down as he tries to breathe against this wooden stake that he's nailed to, this cross. Around him, there's a crowd that are jeering at him. And on either side of him, there are two thieves. Both of them railing on him. So, so he's hanging there. And all the sin of all mankind is coming upon him. And, and all the wrath of God against sin is coming against him. So he's suffering physically, spiritually, emotionally. Uh, he's being attacked verbally by people just like he was attacked physically. He is naked. He's, in, he's being shamed. He's being tortured to death. And these two thieves have a front row seat. And they're watching him die like no man has ever died. And they're listening to the words coming out of his mouth, and they're amazed. At least one of them is. And he turns to the other as the Spirit of God begins to work on his heart, and he says this, Are we indeed, and we indeed are suffering justly, for we receive what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. The thief recognizes that Jesus is the real deal. He doesn't deserve to die, and he's right. Jesus isn't on the cross because he deserves all that. He's up there because I deserve it. He's up there because you deserve it. The wages of sin is death. Somebody's got to die for what I've done. I've got to die for it, or my substitute, Jesus, has got to die for it. But somebody's got to pay the price that my sin has racked up. There's a bill that I can't pay. So Jesus dies in my place and pays my debt. I owe, and he pays it all. So when Jesus is hanging there, he's not hanging there because he's done anything wrong. He's right. Verse 42 in 23, chapter 23 says, And he was saying, this is the thief, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. That thief has just called out to Jesus by faith. He's identified him as a king. Now, you don't see many people being tortured to death with nails in their hands and feet hanging on a cross and think, well, there's the king of the universe, but this thief did. He knew he had no hope, that he was, he was minutes, if not hours, away from facing God, but he would not last through the day. That man's life was leaving his body. Now, he's never been to a church. He's never held a Bible. He's, he's never done anything, offered a gift, nothing. But you're not saved by doing any of that stuff. He's not even been baptized. The only way that you're saved is through faith in Jesus alone. It's through the grace of God alone. It's through Christ alone. And this man called upon Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And here's what Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. That's that word that we just heard, isn't it? Paradise. Where did Jesus go when he died? He went to heaven. Where did the thief go when he died? The one that called on Jesus for salvation. He went to heaven. Because heaven and paradise are interchangeable words. You can read in Re Revelation chapter 2 verse 7 where it says that those who are overcomers are going to get to eat at the tree of life in the paradise of God. Later on in the book of Revelation, the paradise of God is identified as heaven. You can read it in Revelation 22. Paradise and heaven are interchangeable words. So when Paul says, I got taken to heaven or I got taken to paradise, he's talking about the same place. Now, let me tell you something else. He says, he says, I got caught up. It means he got snatched up. Now, you know this word probably from somewhere else. 
1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17, it says, We who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. You see, when Jesus died on the cross, he said before he was going to die that he would rise on the third day. And he did that very thing. Jesus got up out of the tomb. He walked around for a little while, but eventually he went back to heaven. He ascended there bodily, and he's seated now at the right hand of the Father. But the Bible says one day he's coming back. And as he comes down, the Bible says the church goes up. And it's what we call the rapture. Now, the word rapture is not in your Bible but that's okay, because we use words like that sometimes to describe something, and with one word, we could say a lot. We do the same thing with the word trinity. The word trinity is not in your Bible, but the concept is. The word rapture is not in your Bible, but that doesn't mean there's no rapture in your Bible. The catching up of the church, the snatching away of the church is in the Bible. So Paul says, what happened to me? I got caught up. I got, sna I got raptured into heaven. He said, I don't know if it was just my soul or my body and my soul went, but I got there. And he said, something happened to me when I got there in verse 4. He said, I heard some stuff, inexpressible words, which means if you tried to repeat them, you're not able to. They, they, they talked in a way he wasn't able to talk. He couldn't communicate like they communicated. At least he can't when he comes back to earth. They, they're inexpressible. I couldn't do it. But he said, even if I had permission to translate and, and tell you, or even if I wanted to translate and tell you what I heard, he said, I don't have permission to do it. Because God's got secrets. There's some things that God knows that you don't, and God's not told you, and maybe he's not ever going to tell you. And that's okay, because he's God. So in heaven, they're talking about something that Paul got privy to. You and I won't ever know it, not in this life. He said, I heard maybe one day God wants to surprise you with something. Who knows? But God's got his reasons. But he says there's words that were spoken which a man is not permitted to share. Now let me just ask you. You go to a party. Does that sound like a good story to tell at a party? I mean, that's pretty impressive, right? I mean, that's kind of like, you know, I caught the game-winning touchdown pass in, in the in the state championship game. I mean, it's one of those kind of stories, right? That's something people talk about, something people brag on. Paul's not said a word about it. He says it's not profitable. He said, if you want me to talk about something, ask me about how weak I am. Now, that's not how most people think, is it? That's how God wants us to think. He said, profitable, he said it's not profitable, verse 1, to talk about these sorts of things. Why not? Because for Paul, weakness is important. Weakness matters. And if I start talking about myself and building up myself and talking about my experience and my story, I might get the focus off Jesus, get it on me, and I might be building myself up, and, and I might start feeling, feeling full of myself and full of pride. And the whole point is I need to be humble. I need to be weak. That sort of stuff works against weakness, doesn't it? So he says, I didn't talk about it. He said, I was called up to paradise, I couldn't do it. He said, on behalf of such a man, I'm going to talk about that, boast about that. He said, on my own behalf, I'm not going to boast, verse 5, except in regard to my weaknesses. And in verse 6, he says, if you want to credit me with anything, talk about what you see me do and what you hear me say. Paul has done something here for us. He's made like a weakness sandwich. He started out talking about, I'm, I'm, I'm so weak, they're letting me down in a fish basket outside this city wall. And then he gives you the, the, the meat of it, something that's pretty spectacular right in the middle, doesn't he? Man, God took me to heaven, raptured me right up into the presence of God. I heard some things, man, I can't tell you what I heard, but it was awesome. By the way, doesn't that go against a lot of what you see advertised? Don't you see these people saying, well, I, I went to heaven and came back, let me write a book and sell it to you and make you a lot of money. Or some of these phony, lying people that get on TV and say, God gave me a vision, let me tell you what God told me. And then you hear them speak and they say something that contradicts the Word of God. And these people write these books about heaven and it contradicts the Word of God. Anytime you see or hear somebody doing something like that, if they're telling you something different from what the Word of God says, they're frauds, they're phonies, they're liars. And by the way, I've never yet read a book of somebody that said they died and went to heaven and came back and wrote about it that didn't contradict the Bible. Every one of them's a liar and a fake. They make a lot of money. Paul said, I died, went to heaven. I can't tell you what I saw and what I heard. How about that? Anyway, 
Paul's got his weakness sandwich going here. He starts out by weakness, puts this meaty thing right there in the middle. That, that man, got raptured to heaven. And then what does he come back with? Weakness again. It's like bookends, isn't it? Holding the thing up, holding it together. Why? The weakness is what he wants you to focus on, not this. He's telling you this amazing story, but, but the weakness, he's trying to take the story. It may be impressive. He didn't really want to have to share it. Really hadn't ever done it before. It happened, so he's got to do it, and he needs to do it. But, hey, the weakness. Most of us aren't going to have the I got raptured in the heaven story. Can I just say probably all of us? But every one of us deals with weakness. We need that part. So listen to what Paul says happened to him in verse 7. He said, again, basket, the blessing, now the beating. Look, look at this. This starts the beating part. Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelation." For this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh. Now, when I hear the word thorn, here's what I think. I think a little splinter, like I might dig out of my foot when I walked around barefoot with my dog outside when I was a little boy. Go hunting in the woods, not wear any shoes, take my gun, go shoot squirrels and rabbits and birds and things like that, and come back and got to get a tweezers and a needle in the night and get all these sticks out of my foot where I walked on the ground without shoes because I'm an idiot. But, but I did it all the time. Um, that's not what this means, though. This is a sharp, large instrument that you impale people with. Um, you might think about a, a stake like a, in a Dracula movie where they'd stab them through the heart, but you've got to think about something even bigger than that. It is meant to prolong physical anguish. Paul says in this verse, it is torment which means it's a humiliating sort of violence being perpetrated against him, like being slapped around publicly. So he's got this thorn in his flesh that, that's impaled him. We don't know what it is, but I think there's a reason why God didn't tell us what it is. Because if God told us one thing, you'd say, well, I've got something different. You don't need to know what it is in the particulars, but you need to know that there are times stuff comes against you like this. Now, how did it come against Paul? Paul says it was a demon, a messenger of Satan, a demonic attack that, that came against him. You see it in verse 7? It, there was given to keep me from exalting myself. There was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Phys, uh, spiritual beings. Yeah, there's angels. There's fallen angels, demons. Can't see them, but they're real. And you might not think that a spiritual being could perpetrate a physical attack against you that could cause you bodily harm and, and take out some part of your body and, and cause you humiliating, long-term prolonged agony. Paul says it happened to him. By the way, a lot of times people have something bad happen to them like that, and, and the ones around them start asking, well, wonder what they did for God to get them like that. Well, he didn't do anything wrong. He was doing everything right. Don't be foolish and make that mistake. Just because bad things happen to people doesn't mean they're doing anything wrong. Paul's serving Jesus, loving Jesus, winning people to Jesus, planting churches. And Satan wants to come attack him, stake him. I mean, what if he took out the cartilage in his knee with all that traveling Paul had to do, and he had to walk around with a limp? Some of y'all have had knee replacements, and you know how bad that feels not having any cartilage in that knee. Can you imagine if that was Paul for 20 years like that? I don't know what it was. Don't need to. Satan got him. Paul says, it was given to me. Remember the title of the message? The gift of weakness. Who gave it to him? It was God. God did it. Because God is sovereign and God's in control. The way it works, if the devil wants to attack you, he's got to get permission to do it. You belong to God. If he's going to get to you, the only way he gets to you is God lets him. He wanted to attack Paul. God let him. Man, why in the world would you do that, God? But he had a reason. There's a purpose behind it. It served the purposes of God. Paul tells you at the beginning in verse 7, what does he say? To keep me from exalting myself. He says it was because of the greatness of the revelations, plural revelations. This isn't the only revelation Paul ever had. He had more of them. We know about some of them. God was doing something amazing and wonderful in his life. He's having things happen to him that nobody else has happened to him. And God says, you know what? Big boy, I need to knock you down a peg or two. 
You ever known somebody that's had so much given to them? Maybe life's been real good or easy for them. Good looking, rich family, strong, athletic, popular. And they're just the worst people in the world to be around. You ever know somebody like that? Just full of themselves. They, the only thing that one they think about is themselves. I mean, just miserable people. There's people out there like that. Sometimes when you get so much, you think it's all about you, all about me, 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 me. The focus gets on you. But God says, I know what you need, Paul. You need something in your life to keep you humble, something to keep you dependent on me, something to keep you weak. And the devil wanted to get Paul, and God let him because that's what God was going to use. Have you ever thought that God's given you some of your weaknesses because you need them? Can you imagine what you would have been like if you hadn't have gotten them? You might not have been able to handle it. You might have been the one that was miserable to be around. Your weaknesses open the door for God's power to come to work in your life. That's what Paul's teaching us here. Uh, Paul says, There was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me, to torture me, to keep me from exalting myself. He says in verse 8, I prayed to God three times and asked God to remove it. God said no. Sometimes you'll pray and you'll ask God, help me with this. God, this hurts. God, I hate this. God, I don't want to be like this. God, this is terrible. And God says no. Now, God told Paul no. He'll tell us no too, won't he? So I've got to be okay with that. But God does give us something else instead of taking it away. Look at verse 9. He said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, which means God is enough. God's grace is when God gives you power that you don't have. God gives you anything that you don't have, and, but he gives it to you not because you deserve it. That's, that's grace. If you deserved it, it wouldn't be grace. But God gives us what we don't deserve, what we don't have, but what we need so we might make it through. I have enough grace for you, God says, so that you don't have to have this taken away. You can get through it with me. And he goes on and says, not just is my grace sufficient for you, but my power is perfected. So God's power comes to bear in a person's life. In, in a way of perfection. The word pe perfection here means uh, to become more completed, to be brought to completion. So the power of God is in your life. If, if Jesus is in your life, if you put your faith in him, it, certainly God's power has come to bear in your life because he rescued you, he saved you, he brought you back from the dead. He raised you up to give you life in Jesus. But what if that power could become more manifested in your life, it, more power working in you and through you. Well, the way that comes is usually by weakness being in your life. My power is perfected in weakness, he says. So grace is sufficient, power is perfected. So Paul says in verse 9, most gladly, therefore, I'm going to rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Now, how in the world does the power connect to my weaknesses? You know, we talked about this a little bit over and over again, going all throughout this book. We started in chapter 1. Paul talked about how, at one point, he was convinced that the situation he was in, he wasn't going to make it out alive. He and the men with him, they, they were all going to die. He said, but that taught me to depend upon the God who raises the dead. And when we were in verse 9 of chapter 1, I reminded you this. The ones who need resurrection power are dead people, right? You're living, you don't need resurrection power. And, and so I don't think it's by accident that he said that the God who raises the dead there. Because here's what I found out. That Jesus, when he calls us, bids us to come and die. He says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow after me. But my flesh wants to live for this life. 
uh, get most out of this life, live, live for this world. But the Word of God tells me I live, need to live for Jesus and to live, live, need to live for the next world. I need to have my eyes fixed on eternity looking ahead. And very often what has to happen is I've got to die to myself and this life that I might live for the next one. And the deader I get, the more resurrection power comes to bear in my life. The weaker I get, the stronger he gets. Because anytime I feel like I'm strong, I feel like I don't need God. You're the same way. You got a problem, I almost guarantee you there's times where you've got things that you struggle with, but you say, you know what, I can fix this. You probably don't pray about it, don't seek God for it, don't ask God for help for it. You just get after it and you do it. But if you get to the point where you're so at the end of your rope and there's no hope, there's no way out, there's no more resources, there's nowhere to turn, nowhere to run, nowhere to hide, and, and you fall on your face before God and say, God, I need you. God, help me. God, help me. That's where God wants you to be. Dependent on him. The world says be independent. Be strong. Jesus says, you need to know who you are. You're not strong, but I am. I'll be strong in you, though. I'll help you. I'll deliver you. I'll give you what you don't have to get you through this time, to help you to make it through. And that's what Paul's saying. Here. He's discovered the secret. The power of God comes to bear in my life. But it's not because I'm strong. It's because I'm weak. And the weaker I know I am, the weaker I, I, I have this perspective about myself and my life, the more I'm humbled and dependent on him. It changes your life, your outlook, your prayers, everything. Paul is teaching us something here. He says, if you want to know about me, let me talk about my weaknesses. Weaknesses are the way to have power. He goes on in verse 10 and says, I'm content with weaknesses, meaning he delights in them. He's very pleased with having them. He says, with insults, distresses, persecutions, difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, what happens? That's when I get strong. The devil said, you know what, I'm going to get Paul. He's out there winning all these people to Jesus, planting all these churches. I'm going to attack him physically. He won't be able to go. How about you let me have a shot at him, God? All right, go ahead. The devil had a plot to destroy Paul. What happened? The devil was allowed to get in his life and work, attacking him physically. Paul said, I got stronger. So he won more people to Jesus, planted more churches, far more effective for God because he was weak than he ever would have been had the devil not touched him. The devil thought he's winning, and God let the devil defeat himself. But God's got a way of doing that, doesn't he? The devil thought he was going to win by putting Jesus on the cross. But three days later, he found out different. It's been said over and over again by many people throughout the years. Any man that God's going to use greatly, or woman, that God's going to use greatly, he's going to first hurt deeply. There's something about God bringing weaknesses into a person's life that helps prepare them for what God has for them. You know, some, sometimes people are so weak, they, they really physically can't do anything but pray. But do you want to know that some of the most powerful prayer warriors you can find are the people that are the weakest. If you can't do anything else, you can always pray. You don't even have to speak and pray from your heart. God will hear that. God uses prayer. So how do we deal with weakness? Let me give you a few thoughts and then we're done. Uh, some people want to escape it, and I think if you're suffering and you want to pray and ask God to take it away from you, 